So what were you doing in 1995? Hands up if you were alive in 1995. OK, good. Uh, hands up if you were on the internet already. OK, a few, good. Uh, hands up if you were getting paid to work on the internet, like commercially. No, a couple of hands, OK. Um, 1995, this browser, Netscape Navigator 2, was released. And amongst other things, it included a little language you might have heard of called JavaScript. Now, you might be thinking, why at a conference where people are talking about the future of JavaScript, future of front-end development, I'm talking about a 20-year-old browser? Mostly, it just seemed like a fun idea to kind of look back and try and implement something that we might build today in a browser in an old browser that wasn't really designed for it. Uh, so really, just a bit of nostalgia, because I was kind of around for not quite this early, but early enough. Uh, mostly, though, I'm getting old, and you kids these days don't know how good you've got it with all the dev tools and everything you've got access to. My journey with JavaScript started my first job out of university, probably about 1999. And commonly, we'd use JavaScript to implement this kind of navigation. You couldn't do this with CSS at the time. You had to use JavaScript. This is actually one I found on Web Archive that I built probably about 2002 or so. And so when I started that first job, one of my coworkers had built this library that could work in all the browsers we had to support, which at the time would have been like IE5, IE6, Netscape 4, Netscape 6, all with slightly different ways of doing dynamic content. And so it was really impressive just like how much effort you had to put in to get that working. But all that still was five years after Netscape Navigator 2. So to understand why we're going to have limitations when we try and implement modern techniques in this old browser, it's worth looking back at what this browser, like what JavaScript was created for in the first place. Even though it's in the name, JavaScript has very little to do with Java. Um, it was just really. Uh, Netscape wanted to take advantage of the popularity of Java at the time with Java applets, and they got a trademark agreement with Sun to use the Java name. During development, JavaScript was actually called uh, Mocker initially, and then LiveScript in the first Navigator betas before it finally came out as JavaScript. The Netscape 2 documentation described JavaScript as a compact, object-based scripting language for developing client and server internet applications. That's what I found interesting. I didn't realize this, that server internet applications were actually something that um, was intended for JavaScript from the beginning. So Netscape had something called Netscape Enterprise Server. And as part of that, there was a component called Livewire, which let you write server-side JavaScript. It was more like PHP than Node.js in that you had a HTML page with a server tag. And in that server tag, you could write JavaScript that would be evaluated on the server to make database calls and things like that. But that kind of died away with Netscape Enterprise Server, and it wasn't for another, whatever it is, 10, 15 years until backend JavaScript became a thing again. Mostly what JavaScript was used for was um, for form validation. As now, back then, network round trips were um, expensive, potentially. And so any time you could save the user by telling them they'd fill in the form incorrectly um, was very helpful. And so. At the time, though, you couldn't do any nice client-side stuff. You basically had to pop up an alert to tell them what they'd filled in. So I didn't want to just do something, aim for something simple. So I wanted to set myself a goal to try and build something in Netscape 2 that I knew was going to be challenging. And so I decided to choose uh, to do MBC, mainly because to-do lists are familiar for everyone. Um, for those not familiar with to do MBC, it's Coincidentally, a project started by Addy, who just spoke. And it's basically a repository of to do MVC, uh, of this to do list implemented in various frameworks. I knew I wasn't going to be able to get it to look like this, or I wasn't even sure how, how I was going to be able to get in terms of functionality. Um, but I gave it a shot anyway. So I faced some early challenges before I even started working on the to do list. Uh, first of all, I basically so I got my virtual machine set up. I got Netscape running, and um, one thing I couldn't do, one thing I wanted to do was just to try and load a script, show an alert box, just to make sure everything was working. And so I had a web server running on the host machine, which was how I could still develop on my Mac and just load pages on Windows. And for the life of me, I just couldn't get it to load. Like it would. Um, the script wasn't loading. Looking at my web server logs, there was no request for the script, and I wasn't sure what was going on. Eventually, somewhere in the documentation, I found 
that uh, the source attribute wasn't actually supported for the script tag in Netscape 2. Basically, all scripting had to be in line. Um, the next challenge was going to be that, uh, that there was no DOM API. There was no way to rewrite elements that were on the page or even access most elements on the page. Basically, Netscape, like most browsers, would render the page. You could have script tags on the page while it was rendering and write out dynamic content. But once the page was finished, if you say, as a result of an event handler or a set timeout, you did another document.write, then um, it would clear out what was on the page and start a new page. And I didn't want to cheat by just having my whole dynamic app be in a document.write. I didn't think that would be fair. So before I talk about how I actually implemented what I did, let's just have a look at how far I got. So this is to do MVC running in Netscape 2. Um, it's dynamic, so you can actually check and uncheck items and the content updates. You can add new items. I'll need to relax after this. Um, filtering works. You can clear the completed items. Yeah, so the basics are there. Oh, that's complete items. Um, so let's do, rather than just showing this, let's talk about how it was actually implemented. The key to all this was frame sets. For those not familiar with frame sets, and you may not be if you haven't been doing web development for a long time, um, because it's now a deprecated feature, frame sets, you could basically, instead of a body tag on a page, you could have a frame set tag. And in there, you could define frames of content to be loaded from different sources. It's essentially what evolved into iframes eventually. And then along with that, you could nest frame sets, and you could lay them out using these row and column attributes. So it was kind of like the early days of CSS grid, if you want to think about it that way. Um, and so frame sets were the key because I was looking at the Netscape 2 doc. So this is the documentation that Netscape provided for JavaScript. And um, it was used the frame sets. So the navigation was on the left and then the content was on the right. But one thing they had was down the bottom these hide contents buttons. And when you hit that button, it would hide and show. And that was dynamic. And I was thinking, how'd they do that? And looking at the source for that was what um, inspired my solution. So I built what's called a pseudo-dynamic app. Basically, you have a frame set, and the state lives in the frame set itself. So in a script tag, you set up some JavaScript state. Then there's two frames. And the reason for this, another one of those things that took me a while to work out, was that you need at least two frames. Otherwise, a frame set won't render at all. Um, and so the content frame is the dynamic part. It's written out using a combination of static HTML and document.writes. So just have a quick look at that. So you've got the state, and then you've got document.write tags that access the state from the parent frame. And then you've got, say, a button. And if you want to update something in the state, then you have an event handler that calls a function in the parent frame set. Now, the key to it is this. This is effectively the equivalent of um, document.reload, which, uh, which didn't exist. And so basically, we're telling the content frame to reload itself. And when it reloads itself, it'll read the current state. And so that's how the application works. Um, and when you think about it, you've got the state. The state gets reflected by the view. And any actions that happen on the view get fed back into the state. So essentially, what we've done is implemented the Flux model for Netscape 2. <laughs> but apart from just the challenge of how to actually set up the architecture for this, there was some. Um, just challenges in terms of limitations in the language and limitations in the dev environment that I want to take you through. First of these was error handling. When a JavaScript error occurred, you would just get this modal pop-up. You couldn't click outside it. Um, it was useful. Like, it told you what line the error was on, told you what the error was. Conveniently, they used a lot of keywords, reserved a lot of keywords from uh, C and Java. So const was already reserved back in 1995, which is convenient now. And yeah, when you dismissed it, if there was another error, then you would get the next error would pop up. And so, for example, if you visit google.com in Netscape 2, you get this whole bunch of errors from their analytics code. And you basically have to, you can't really tell from the frame rate of the GIF, but I'm basically dismissing dialogue after dialogue after dialogue just to be able to see the page underneath. So these days when we develop, we're used to um, writing to the console. Like, if we just want to quickly output a state of a variable at a particular point in time, we use the console. Netscape didn't have a console. There was a Java console for Java applets to write to, but there was no JavaScript console. So basically, instead, we would use um, alerts. You basically 
pop up alert and with the contents of your variable at a particular point in time. And sometimes this was the only way to debug something. In case of event handlers, there were some event handlers that uh, some event handlers would just fail silently. They wouldn't even pop up the standard error dialog. So you had to basically put an alert after every line of your event handler and try and work out which one fired last, and from there, work out what the actual error was. At least you knew which line it was on, probably. The other thing we're used to when developing applications these days is being able to use like the elements panel in uh, DevTools and see all the elements on the page, what current state they're in. But all you had was view source in Netscape 2. And it wasn't even view source of a frame. You could only view the source of the page itself, which wasn't very useful when all the page contained was a frame set. And so a common technique, um, a common technique when building dynamic content with document.write would be to put the string in a variable first, alert that, and you have to manually inspect to see where you've missed a bracket or quote or something that was causing it to render incorrectly. And potentially, you would, if it was a big string, I remember at times copying the contents of the alert and pasting it into a document where I could use like HTML tidy or something to try and format um, the HTML to see where I'd missed, missed some bit of HTML. Next challenges were around the language itself. So there was no short object shorthand. So it meant creating a state, um, a nested state, took a lot of verbosity. And the other thing you might notice there is that my to-dos aren't an array. They're an object. And it looks like an array, like it's numerically indexed and it's got a length. But the reason for that was JavaScript 1 didn't even actually contain an array data type. It didn't actually come until JavaScript 1.1, which was um, like nine months after Netscape 2. The documentation mentioned this. It said, just use objects. They're similar enough to um, arrays, basically, and provide like, a little helper function for creating an array from like, a set of arguments. There was no, uh, the only way you could declare a function was globally. So you couldn't declare a function inside a function. You couldn't declare an anonymous function. You couldn't have a function as a result of an event, uh, as a callback for like, a set timeout. So that was pretty limiting. Uh, one workaround for, for example, for set timeouts and things like that was you'd use the um, eval syntax of set timeout, where basically you could pass a string, and that string would be evaled after the timeout had expired. The object model in uh, Netscape 2 was also very limited. As I mentioned, Netscape was really designed for form validation. Uh, well, ju sorry, JavaScript was intended mainly for form validation and smaller things like that. So it's reflected in the object model. You basically had access, access to forms, and within those forms, just the various elements. There was no arbitrary access to any element on the page. <coughs> Similarly, the event model was quite limited. There was no add event listener. You couldn't um, programmatically add events. Uh, that was still five years away, and I guess with Inline scripting, it wasn't much benefit to being able to add it programmatically. And the event handlers themselves were limited. So for example, now where you might expect a mouse over to work on um, any element that has a size and is visible, in Netscape 2, it would only work for an anchor, but it wouldn't work for an image, for example. And you basically had to just look at the docs to see what elements, events were supported where. Obviously, uh, the last challenge was styling. So I had to use tables for layouts, although that really didn't go away for at least another 10, 15 years. Um, if you've had to work on email templates, you may have even written a table last week um, for layout. And colors were fairly limited. So you could set, basically, you could set the background color of the body, but you couldn't even set the background color of a table or a table cell, which is why the layout of that to-do list was just all white, pretty much. So basically. The, all you had access to for in terms of styling was the font tag. And font tag, you could set the size and the color of the text. And again, it was limited in that um, the size wasn't a pixel size. It was basically a, a fixed number, like 1 to 7 you could set it to. And that was basically decided by the browser what those seven sizes were. You could also use relative sizes, so plus minus, based on the size of the containing element. Now, you might have noticed I said there you could set the font size and font color. One thing you couldn't set is the font face. 
So the font face attribute wasn't actually part of the HTML 3.2 spec even. So Netscape didn't let you actually change the font. The only reason you're not looking at Times New Roman right now is because I've just changed the default browser font to something that's a bit more pleasant. Uh, and so yeah, the face attribute was something that Microsoft actually added as a custom attribute initially in their browser. So apart from that, there was a couple of little quirks I just one I wanted to show you was like a little memory corruption issue I ran into. If you really rapidly click on those items, you suddenly get memory leaks from outside of your page, like the URL or sometimes a HTTP header or something. So that was fun. And at one point, I think I had something where if I didn't force the encoding to UTF-8, I would just get like weirdness with the font, but that may have just been a virtual box issue. So we've kind of taken Netscape 2 as far as we can take it. I want to kind of move forward at least a little bit in time to a browser that was supposed to support building dynamic applications. That browser wasn't Netscape 3. Um, Netscape 3 came out pretty quickly after Netscape 2, had some JavaScript improvements like arrays. But it didn't have any I had the same programming model for dynamic content. So instead, let's move on to Netscape 4. So Netscape 4 was the first Netscape browser to support what was called at the time dynamic HTML. Uh, did anyone own a copy of this book at any point in time? Yeah, there's a few. I didn't own the third edition, but I look back at my Amazon purchase history, and this is like one of the first books I ever bought in like 99 when I started working. Um, and the way Netscape implemented dynamic HTML was through the use of the layer tag. <laughs> so layers were an element that you could reposition, you could uh, modify its contents, you could resize it. So finally, you could sort of build some dynamic, uh, dynamic content on your page without jumping through, in theory, too many hoops. So let's have a look what the to-do list, apart from just with layers and with all the other features in Netscape 4, what it looks like. So there you have it. It's looking a little bit nicer. We've got different background colors at least. We've got a little key line in between items. It's all still tables for layout mostly, but um, it is using layers as well. So we can still add an item. Um, yeah, all that works. I'm not going to go through all this part again. So let's talk about how the implementation in Netscape 4 differed from what I did in Netscape 2. So now instead of using frame sets, we're using layers to implement this. Now something that's not reflected in these slides was that I built like a little component abstraction around the layers. So I could have essentially like the application was an object and it had child objects for the different components, all that knew about their layer and could re-render their own layer. In terms of the data model, it still looked pretty similar in terms of the state being maintained in the parent and the children um, being able to re-render themselves. So you can see their layers, um, basically they implement their own document. Each layer is its own HTML document. So you still use document.write to update a layer, and you still face the same restrictions in that as soon as you start writing to it, it resets the content that's already there. But because these are smaller components, it means probably not as bad that you've got basically uh, HTML in strings everywhere. And so I kind of used like a, again, to use the analogy, like a react -y type model where when I wanted to update, I just basically told all the child components to update with the current state, and they knew how to re-render themselves. So what challenges were there when building uh, for Netscape 4? So firstly, I've already talked about briefly about what the challenges were with layers. Now, the big thing about layers was they're always absolutely positioned. So you couldn't have a layer inside another element. Um, you could have a layer inside a layer, but you couldn't have a layer like within the layout of an existing page. So for example, that example I gave before with the navigation menu, in your normal HTML layout, you would just leave a gap, and then you would absolutely position the layers to fit in there. The challenge with that was that, for example, for a to-do list, which is dynamically sized depending on the number of items, you need to have a way for those components to be able to say how tall they are based on the number of items they've got. So if you want to position like the footer underneath, for example. And obviously, uh, debugging is difficult. You, as I mentioned before, there's no elements panel. It still didn't exist in Netscape 4. And so it meant if, say, a layer disappeared off screen, you had no way of telling why. Um, you couldn't tell 
if it was because you'd set the X position incorrectly or whether you'd hidden it inadvertently or some other, some other bug. So again, it was a lot of manual alerts and waiting for errors and things like that. The layer API kind of looked like uh, forms before. So we still couldn't just arbitrarily get any elements. You could only get uh, layers by name or by ID. And once you had access to a layer, you could access this document through its document property. You could uh, set the attributes of layers at kind of like uh, almost like CSS styling type properties. And it also had these convenience functions for things like relative positioning, relative sizing, which could be useful at times. And if you really want to go crazy and you had nested layers, then you could um, access them like this. Uh, probably not recommended, though. And one thing I want to just point out there is for visibility, um, it was actually wasn't a Boolean. It was three states. So you could have hide, show, and inherit, I think, was the other one. Debugging in Netscape 4 wasn't much easier, but it was a little bit easier. No longer did you get a modal alert that would block, um, block the page. You would instead get told there was a JavaScript error. And if you type JavaScript colon, as suggested there, you would get the JavaScript console. Now, this wasn't the console as we're used to today. It was fairly limited. But it would show you all the errors that had occurred, not just the first one. Um, that's probably a bad example. But if you had like a set timeout or set interval that was firing every 100 milliseconds and throwing an error, it would eventually tell you that there was too many errors and it would stop processing them. There was this JavaScript type in that let you type in and evaluate arbitrary JavaScript. But there was limits to what it could do as well. If you typed in window, all you got was object window. There was no way to inspect uh, the properties of an object unless you knew what they were in advance. If you typed in window location, then you would get the location of the JavaScript console, not the page you opened it from, which wasn't necessarily very helpful. And so lastly, styling in Netscape 4 was a little bit better. And it was the first Netscape version to implement CSS. But it wasn't really CSS. It had a lot of issues. Well, I mean, it was CSS. Uh, basically, the history of that is Netscape had originally been working towards implementing JavaScript style sheets. And I think there's a talk on JavaScript style sheets later on in this conference. And, and they were hoping JavaScript style sheets were what was going to be standardized. But instead, CSS got standardized. And they had to kind of scramble to provide an implementation of CSS in Netscape 4. And so it shows with the kind of bugs that, um, that occur. This wasn't necessarily a bug, but a limitation at the time was only one class um, name per class attribute. So you couldn't compose classes, which meant that there was a lot of repetition of styles if you wanted to have different variants of a class. Inheritance was buggy or missing at times. If you set the color of the body text, if you created a table, then in the table, the color would be reset again. So a lot of duplication, and with fonts as well. Lastly, the styles were just buggy in general. Like I've set padding on that last list item, and it's added the padding to the body, but it hasn't actually recentered the bullet. So just to wrap up, what have we learned? Nothing you can probably apply to your day job. But hopefully, um, what you've gotten out of this is an appreciation for um, just how difficult it was to work with these early browsers. Basically, the, there was a lot of challenges involved. Uh, and so if you're around in the early days of the web and you saw some cool websites, you can hopefully have an appreciation of just how much work would have gone into making those work right. Um, and just in general, I really want to personally, and probably from, hopefully from everyone here, thank all the people that work on developer tools. There's probably a few of them in this room. Uh, it's really awesome, the tools we have today. And it just makes it so much easier to work with the web. So with that, this one is done. And thank you.